Spirit. And the truth is, our story should tell of Him. Um, our story should be all because of Him. We, when we share, when we live out the fruit of the Spirit, it's because He lived through us. So to tell you my story, I need to be talking about Him because that is our story. So thank you, Amy. Um, I want to bring up the fact that I'm wearing this right now. Um, it's usually not what I wear to church or anywhere. A little green ribbon that I'm wearing right now. Today is Cerebral Palsy Awareness Day. And the reason why I'm wearing this is because we have a friend who, uh, her name is Vanessa. She's the one that does the Little Red Pantry that we did. Uh, the kids got all the food together to put in the pantry, and it takes care of people that have needs. Well, she's the one that has that Little Red Pantry in front of her house. Well, her son, River, has cerebral palsy. And um, we just, I, we just want to let you guys know, um, if they're listening, uh, we want to let you know that we're, we're praying for you guys. It's not just the, the disorder that you're going through. The parent has to put a lot into, they invest a lot into these people's lives because it's not just an everyday thing. They pour their heart and soul into these kids. And uh, we just want to say thank you uh, to you for what you do. And we're praying for all of you in that situation. So that is why I'm wearing this today. And we just want to kind of give a shout out to River, um, the one that has cerebral palsy, and just let, let you know that we're praying for you. So if you have your Bibles, let's... Uh, well, first of all, let me change things a little bit. Today's Palm Sunday. This is Palm Sunday. This is the week before Easter. This is what we know as Palm Sunday. And I think we should speak about that subject today, Palm Sunday. And I can't think of any better way to do this than to go by way of the fruit of the Spirit. So now, open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. And let's talk about Palm Sunday in a totally different way than we've ever done before. Because we are in a series of the fruit of the Spirit, and today we want to speak on gentleness. And you're never going to see a greater picture of gentleness than what we see in Palm Sunday, and we will lead up to that. But Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 in 23, here's our verse that we've been reading every week for I don't know how many weeks now, I'd have to count, but Galatians 5:22. but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. The word for gentleness here can also be translated into meekness. Meekness or gentleness, they, uh, it's, the same it's the same word, two words that we can use out of the same word out of the Greek. It means gentleness or meekness. When we think of somebody being meek in nature, we often picture them as soft or weak. That's usually how we see that. But we cannot forget that this is a fruit of the Spirit, and I would venture to say that God is anything but weak. So if this is a fruit of the Spirit of God, then weakness cannot be what we're talking about here. So a lot of times when we think of gentleness or meekness, we think of that person that's really timid and they're, they're kind of weak. Um, but that's not what we're dealing with here. When we think of someone who's strong, we usually use synonyms like strength, might, power, greatness, you know, something along that line. But what would you say if I told you the greatest definition, um, the greatest description of absolute strength is actually found in the word gentleness or meekness? It might throw you a little bit because we usually think of it as a weak, a weak or timid person. This is a strength that surpasses any physical strength you can think of. Gentleness. You usually don't think, well, if we're, think of strong words. And somebody raise their hand and say, gentle. Like, that's... That kid loses a point. You know, you don't, gentle is not one of those wor words that we throw in there as a description of strength, but it actually is. It's often seen as weak weakness, but its strength cannot be matched. Gentleness is so strong. It takes us to the characteristic of Christ that is absolutely mind blowing the gentleness of God, the gentleness of Jesus Christ. Years ago, my wife and I went to New York City for the first time. And we, we went by way of the subway. So we, we ride into New York. How many people have been to New York? New York City? A, a few of you. Okay, lots of you. So you'll understand what I'm talking about when I say this. When we got, we, we got to our stop, we get off the subway, and we got all our stuff together, and we started walking towards the escalator. The escalator will take you up to the streets of New York City. So we get on this escalator, and we start riding up. And when we got to the streets of New York City, 
we were totally taken back. The buildings were giants all around us. The city almost just swallows you up. When you come out of that and you look up, you're like, oh my, I am so small. I am so small. And it, it almost seems unreal when you see something like that. That's just buildings. That has nothing to do with creation, God's creation. That's something that we put up as, as mankind. But you still, you come out of that and you look up and you're like, it's, it's mind-blowing. It just, it's incredible. You feel so insignificant at that moment. The whole thing seems unreal. The fruit of gentleness has the same effect when people see it in your life. True gentleness. It doesn't seem that it can be possible that a person can display that magnitude of strength in such a unique way. Gentleness is an incredible amount of strength, but it comes across as meekness. And it's just mind-blowing when you see these two, they almost seem like their opposite definitions come together as one incredible strength. One of the most feared animals in Africa is a lion. Let me illustrate this gentleness like this. One of the most feared animals is the lion. A lion is an extremely powerful creature. Uh, I will not ever sign up to be face to face with one of those things. I'll see it as a di at a distance, I'll watch it on TV. But I do not want to come face to face because this is a powerful creature. It has a very keen sense of hearing that it can hear its prey up to a mile away. That's impressive. Sometimes my wife is talking in the other room and I miss a lot of that. You know, so, uh, you know, uh, a lion, however, can hear its prey a mile away. That's, good, that's a good sense of hearing. A lion's roar can be heard for up to five miles away. Have you ever been to the zoo where you're standing there and looking into the lions and all the kids are there watching lions and we're all joking around, everybody's having a good time, and then that lion decides to roar? Do you see what the people do? They're done. Everybody just shuts up. The lion just said something, we're all listening. Because that is a powerful roar. And you feel so small when that animal just lets out that deep roar. It gets your attention real quick and you feel about that big. Like that is a powerful animal. They can run over 50 miles an hour and they can leap as far as 36 feet. That is an incredible jump. And they need 11 to 18 pounds of food per day to maintain that level of energy. That's a good appetite. Their claws are three inches long, about the length of a human finger, and they can open their jaws up to the width of one foot, which is bigger than the human head, and can bite down with a force of 650 pounds per square inch. It can kill its prey with one bite. And yet a mother lion can gently capture smaller living prey and bring it home in order to teach her cubs how to hunt. With that same powerful jaw, she will gently carry her cubs out of harm's way into safety if needed. Same jaw. She's no less powerful when she carries her cubs than she, when she is hunting. She's just gentler. A lot of power exhibited in a gentle way. Same strength, just used with gentleness. I want to change the way we look at the word gentleness this morning. Instead of being perceived as weak, I want to show how it's actually a picture of strength. If I were to put together a conference right now for men and advertise it as come and see and learn how to be meek, I don't think we're going to break a lot of attendance records. We, uh, we do not see gentleness as a strong suit. Like, men, come learn how to be meek. We're not going to have a very long line of people. You know, that's what we need. We need to learn meekness. It, it, we just see it. We don't see it as strength. We actually see it as weakness. And that's not what this is all about. It's actually incredible strength. It's one of the strongest characteristics for the Christian in displaying the character of God in our lives. Gentleness. Gentleness or meekness is better described as strength under control. Maybe you've heard that definition before. It is strength under control, but it is no less strength. It, it's strength or power under control. A tame horse is no less powerful than a wild horse. They have the same amount of strength. The power 
is just restrained to accomplish the purpose of the master. That is exactly what gentleness is. It's no less strong. Oh, a tame horse and a wild horse have the same amount of strength. But the tame horse, the power is just restrained to accomplish the purpose of the master. Gentleness is designed to do the same thing. The Holy Spirit magnifies Jesus Christ and performs the will of the Father. When our desire is to be in God's will and magnify Christ also, gentleness has an open door into your life. When it's all about pleasing the Master. We know how to be strong or rough or come across abrasive. We, we can all do that. Just irritate any of us and you'll see that side of us. But to come across with gentleness, now that requires more strength because what wants to come out? The abrasiveness. What's held back so gentleness can come out? That abrasiveness. So it requires more strength to produce gentleness than it does to, to produce wrath. Wrath comes easy. Gentleness takes strength. Gentleness is submission to God. Gentleness is humility at its highest level. Humility. Everybody, uh, the idea of being humble. We all understand that. Humility. Let's be humble. Humble is a hard thing to do because, you know, truth is life is all about us. You know, when, when we're uncomfortable, who do, we want, who do we want to have people take care of? Us. When you're hungry, are you thinking about the people that need food or are you thinking about filling your need? You know, we usually take care of us first. We're inward focused a lot. It takes a lot of um, growing in our relationship with God to start taking our vision or our mindset and facing it out instead of in. But God can do that. We usually focus inward though. Humility at its highest level, that's what we're talking about today, is gentleness. Gentleness has no need to prove itself. It does not need to show off its strength. It knows it's strong and it's okay with that information. It does not need to advertise that. It understands what it is, that's all it needs to know, and then it will produce itself with meekness. Its goal is not to show its own greatness, but to accomplish the purpose of the Master, to accomplish the purpose of Jesus Christ. God has displayed this virtue many times in Scripture, and He's also told us what it can do for us if we yield to it. So let's dig in. Let's dig into this idea of gentleness, and let's see what gentleness has to offer and how it can be used in our life. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to any or everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. God just told us a time that gentleness needs to step to the front of the line here. When people ask you about this relationship you have with God, when people ask you about this hope that is in you, when you give them that answer, how are we supposed to give them that answer? With meekness, with gentleness. When it comes to defending your faith, gentleness is to take the lead. When a person's being questioned for their stand in life or when they're being accused, we usually end up putting walls or we go into defense mode when we're being questioned or attacked on the, what we believe or what we think is right. God says to let the gentleness do the, pre do the presentation here. You step back and let gentleness present your relationship with Christ. You stay out of it. What good does it do if you win the argument but you chase the person away? Uh, so, okay, so you won that round but you might have lost that soul. So what good does it do to defend your faith so much that we actually end up offending other people? and chasing them away, but boy, did we make our point, we were right. God says, step back and let gentleness take the presentation here. Let gentleness show your relationship with Christ. Get your emotions out of the way and let gentleness lead the way here. God says to address the situation with a soft answer. Look at Proverbs chapter 15 and verse one. It says a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. In Proverbs, 
Proverbs, when we look at Proverbs, you get those things, um, those ancient Proverbs and stuff like this. A lot of times, Proverbs, the verses in Proverbs read a lot like that, that same way. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. God's word is true. That means that is going to work all the time. A soft answer turns away the wrath. Does that mean it's going to make the person not mad at you? No. It turns it away. It might not be an immediate turn, but that soft answer is going to do its job. Gentleness turns away wrath, but a harsh word, does that ever turn away wrath? <laughs> no, it just stirs up anger. God's absolutely right here, and it works just like that. Gentleness is actually designed, it's designed to diffuse the conflict, which is a cool gift to have, because I know when conflict comes, I don't like conflict. Uh, and some people actually live for this stuff, and that, that's crazy to me. But I don't like conflict. I will deal with conflict if I have to, but I'm not looking for it. I'm not hunting for the stuff, but I don't like conflict. So if God says I could use a soft answer and diffuse that, I want, I want to try that out. I want to use the soft answer to turn away the wrath. It's a, it's a great gift to have. You see, gentleness has an enormous agenda. And each week we talk about the fruit of the Spirit and what it's designed to do and its strength. Well, here it comes for gentleness. It has an enormous agenda. Write it down, remember it, just something. You, do, you want to remember the agenda of gentleness. And this brings a feature that every one of us love. The agenda of gentleness is redemption. That is what it's designed for. It's to redeem. It is redemption. This fruit is looking for the redeeming quality and doing everything it can to achieve that redemption. When my oldest daughter was one, she was one year old, we were looking to buy a house. Now our price range was really small, so our options were really bleak. You know, like I give you $10 for a house, you're only gonna get a certain kind of house for that kind of money, okay? So the lower your price range is, your options get a little shaky, all right? So our price range was low, but we were looking for a house. And what we did was we asked um, the realtor, show us foreclosed homes. Show us something that went back to the bank or show us a repossessed home or something like that. And we'll just try to work on it and then take the value up. That's what we were looking for. I remember um, when we drove by the house that we currently live in right now, my in-laws were with me. And I remember my mother-in-law looking at the house and she says, that thing could suck the lid off a can of paint. <laughs> it could suck the lid off a can of paint. That thing needs so much work. We drive by with paint. It just, it, it needs it so bad. And our house was, it was a beauty. Sad. Yeah, it was, it was sad. When we found the house that we're currently living in right now, it took a lot of imagination and vision to see what it could be instead of what it was. Now we purchased that house for a very low price and put a lot of work a lot of hours of work into that house. See, we invested our time into the house. And we fixed, it, we fixed it up. Today it's a home with a lot more value than it started with. But before it could be taken to a higher value, it had to be redeemed. Someone had to pay the price for it. It had to be purchased before the value could go up. Jesus Christ has that characteristic of gentleness. And how did he find you? His, his price range was high, really high. He paid the ultimate price for you, but when he found you, he didn't take the perfect example because there was no perfect example. He went to the bottom and found us. And he says, now somebody just needs to purchase this life and I can take the value of the life up. And when you got saved, you accepted the price that he paid for you on the cross, and he redeemed you. Gentleness is looking for redemption, is, is seeking redemption. Instead of using harsh words, it uses a soft answer for the purpose of redeeming the relationship. It's always seeking redemption. If I use a harsh word, I can chase the person away, but if I choose a soft word, I might be able to save the relationship. I might be able to redeem the relationship. Romans 12, in verse 18, says, if it, is, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. That is not a suggestion, it is a command. 
God wants this fruit to show in your life because it attracts other people to him. He wants to, you to show that gentleness out of your life. Proverbs 25, verse 15 says, By long forbearance a ruler is persuaded, and a gentle tongue breaks a bone. There's that proverb sounding stuff again. By long forbearance a ruler is persuaded, and a gentle tongue breaks a bone. Gentleness does what it seems least capable of doing. It causes a calloused heart to soften. The, I really am interested in this fruit. It is a good fruit to have. The ruler is persuaded and the hardness of that heart is broken. It is illustrated as a bone here. You mean meekness? That what we usually see as weak has the ability to soften a heart, break that calloused heart. It's gentleness that we're going to send in for this job. Not power, not strength, not force. No, let gentleness do it because it has more strength than everything else that we could send in. Let gentleness do it. It softens it all up. It gets to the heart. It can take a calloused heart. It says a ruler is persuaded. Why do you have to persuade a ruler? They got it all. Why do they need to listen to you? But that gentleness, it softens that heart. And it, it helps people realize there, there is something about that characteristic in that person. They're exhibiting gentleness when, if I'm mad at them, they should be mad at me, but instead they're exhibiting gentleness instead. That's an incredible quality, and it softens the heart. Here's another incredible feature to this fruit. It is always displayed in spite of emotion. It's never displayed within your emotion. It's displayed in spite of it. When it's done wrong, it chooses to respond in righteousness. It does not let personal feelings get in the way of the needed response. Because remember, it's chasing after redemption. Well, a lot of times we're chasing after revenge. <laughs> You know, somebody does us wrong, oh, it's time to get even. Gentleness actually is chasing after the redemption of the relationship. Re I want to find the redeeming quality and I want to pull that out. So gentleness does not ride on our emotions. It rides out in spite of our emotions. When we face opposition, we need to exercise gentleness. Christ wants to pull this out of our life. I want you to show gentleness. Not revenge. Don't try to get even. When they are yelling at you, soft answer. Usually what happens when their voice rises, our voice, it's like a competition. Their voice gets loud, our voice gets louder. Then they see it the same way, and we just keep raising voices and yelling back and forth. Before long, neither one of you are hearing what the other person says. It's just, you know, you jabbed me, I'm going to jab you back. And how does that ever solve anything? But what would happen if the other person's yelling at you, and you answer with a soft answer? What does that do to that other person? They might continue yelling at you and then you just answer softly. What happens to that, that yelling competition? Well, you need more than one person to argue. You need more than one person to compete. If the other person is not competing, competition's over. It just deadens it. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. It says... A, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Gentleness is providing a path for repentance. It's seeking redemption. The soft answer turns away the wrath. God, God set it all up. If you are a servant of the Lord, do not get into that quarrel. Use gentleness. It can deaden it quick. Gentleness will get in there and do the job. Why would we, why would we get into a competition here? Here's where the strength comes in. Look at Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 21 with me. Here's where the strength really comes in. Here's where everybody's just going to love the service here. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Well, that's fascinating. I want you to notice what it says. Don't miss what it says. If your enemy is hungry, 
If your enemy's hungry, this is the person that's in opposition with you. Okay? There's that opposition. This is where gentleness steps up. I want you to give him bread to eat, and if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. What about, what about the competition? No competition. What about the vengeance? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Oh, he'll take care of that. Yeah, what, do, what do I do? Gentleness. Step forward. Are they hungry? Give them something to eat. Are they thirsty? Give them something to drink. Because it says, for you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. When they strike with a comment or behavior that's offensive, God says to strike back with incredible strength that they will not know how to counteract it. I want you to strike back with such incredible strength that they won't know how to counteract it. Strike back with the power of gentleness. Strike back with gentleness. It's difficult to stay angry at someone who refuses to treat you wrong in return. It's hard to keep that momentum up. You keep yelling at me and I keep responding with a soft answer, showing you love. What happens to your side of the argument? Eventually, both of our tones just kind of come back down. Because I don't have a reason. Why are you treating me good when I'm treating you bad? I'm starting to look silly. I better calm mine down. If, you see, if you're going to keep control, I appear to be out of control. Let's just bring it back down and let's have a conversation rather than an argument. It's, it turns away wrath. It's frustrating when you want to be mad at someone, but they keep interacting with a gentle spirit. It's really kind of frustrating, and it's like heaping coals of fire on their head. <laughs> you ever had that spark that lands in your hair? It's kind of irritating, isn't it? It's, like, it's just frustrating. It's irritating. You're trying to put it out. It's the example that Solomon uses. When they're yelling at you, and you go ahead and respond with gentleness, you know that, that irritation, that burning feeling? You're hitting them back with such a strength that they don't know how to counteract that. Why are you in complete control? And I'm out of control. What you're doing is you're softening that heart. There's no stronger punch you can give. Vengeance isn't what you're looking for. God says, try gentleness. Try gentleness and see how that works for you. It's an incredible fruit of the Spirit. Use gentleness. Don't use vengeance. Use gentleness. Remember, gentleness does not have the need to be right or victorious. That's not what it's shooting for. It has the desire to redeem. That's what it's looking for. I'm going to pull out the redeeming quality. I'm not looking for the win here. I don't need to be the victorious one. Look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. It says right there to restore them with the spirit of gentleness. If a person is overtaken in sin, let the spirit of gentleness seek to restore them. It's not about vengeance. It's about pulling out that redeeming quality. Gentleness seeks to restore the broken. It's looking for that redeeming feature. And it's trying to pull that out. What's absolutely amazing is that although gentleness has the desire to restore others, it never forgets about you. It's not only working outward, it's also working inward. It doesn't just take care of outward issues. It doesn't forget about the one who possesses the characteristic. It's also working inward. Remember, it's humility at its greatest level. God loves this attribute so much that he promises to pour out grace to those who possess it. Chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Gentleness is humility at its highest level. And God will pour out the grace. While gentleness is seeking to redeem others, it has a passion for helping you also. James chapter 1 and verse 22 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness, that's gentleness, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. 
It says for us to receive the word with meekness. Receive God's word with meekness. This is the person with a teachable heart. I'm, the day you stop learning is the day you stop growing. When you feel like you have arrived, you will learn nothing else. You will not be teachable and you have reached the end of your success. Always be teachable. When it comes to the Word of God, it says, I want you to receive it with meekness. That teachable spirit, it's pulling out the redeeming qualities of us as well. Gentleness isn't only working outward, it's also working inward. And it's trying to pull out that redeeming quality in us as well. Gentleness doesn't need to look strong. It remains humble. It knows its own strength, but it doesn't need to advertise that strength. It doesn't have the need to be right. It has the need to be right with God. That is what gentleness desires. A restrained power for the purpose of the master. It's not trying to be right. It's trying to be right with God. Just like that tame horse has just as much power as the wild horse, but the power has been restrained for the purpose of the master. Gentleness is this same quality. It has the ability to break down the hardest heart, and it works hand in hand with patience. I love how it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. I like how it all, every one of them reach out to another one. It has the ability to break down the hardest heart, but it works hand in hand with patience for the hope of redemption, no matter how long it takes. It grabs patience and goes right along with it. No matter how long it takes, let's seek the redemption. Love triggers gentleness, and kindness takes it back stage to the soul of the person. That's when gentleness interacts with the soul for the purpose of the redemption. They all work hand in hand, side by side. They come together as one fruit, and they're seeking redemption together. With each of these things working together, the branch is beginning to get pretty loaded down with fruit. It's not just one little piece of fruit that we're looking at. They come together and that branch starts getting loaded. I am the vine, you are the branches. That's what Jesus said. I am the vine, you are the branches. God's not looking for a branch that can stand tall. God's looking for a branch that's willing to bow down under the weight of his own character. He wants to see that fruit develop on that branch where it's starting to get weighed down by fruit. He wants to see that. It's not our greatness that Christ is looking for. It's our humility, our willingness to serve. So he's looking for the branch willing to bow under the weight of that fruit of the Spirit, not one that stands tall and says, look at me, look what I've accomplished. He's looking for the one full of fruit. I would like to take the next few minutes to show you the greatest display of gentleness this world has ever known. God's creation is incredible, and everything that was made was ma made within six days. And I want to give you a couple examples of the power of God's creation. These things blow my mind, and I want to share it with you. One one second of lightning has the power, or has enough energy, to power your home for about two months. That's just one second of one of the many bolts in a thunderstorm. One second has enough energy to power your home for two months. One second. That's a lot of energy. And that's just one bolt. That's just God's creation. It's just something he threw together in that for six days. Threw it together for us. One hurricane has enough energy to be equivalent to 200 times the worldwide electrical generating capacity and has more power than if all the nuclear weapons on earth were to be set off at once within one hurricane. That's a lot of power. If you stretch out the DNA in all of your cells put together, this one, I'm still trying to grab this one. If you were to stretch out the DNA of all your cells put together, it would be about twice the diameter of the solar system. That is a lot of information that God put within our body. That didn't just happen. There 
is a God. In order to have such amazing creations, you must first have an amazing creator. This doesn't just happen. The intelligent design of the universe came from an even more intelligent designer. That's a lot of power. Our God is so powerful that he was able to create all that is in existence within six days. And the only effort that he had to put forth was to speak it into existence. Let there be light. There was light. Let there be animals. There were animals. Let there be land and water. There was land and water. That's the only effort he had to put out was to speak. Now when we think of the power of God's creation, that is an incredible amount of power. But remember, the only effort it took that creator to make all that happen was to speak. That means he must be incredibly powerful to create that with a spoken word. Now think about our God for a second. That is a lot of power. A lot of power. He deserves to be held in the highest esteem. He deserves honor and glory to the infinite degree. He is an amazing God. But I want to show you what he did instead. One week before he was crucified, the God of all creation took a different path. Don't forget about the power of our God, the creator of the whole universe. Don't forget about him and all that power. Jesus tells his disciples to go get the colt of a donkey. I want you to go get a young donkey. An animal that would have represented honor would have been a noble steed, but he chose the lowest animal that showed servanthood. And that culture understood this donkey is a picture of a servant, not of noble, a noble dignitary. Matthew 21 and verse 6. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is Palm Sunday. This is when they take those palm branches and throw them out in front of him, bringing him in as the king that's going to save them from the power of Rome. And they accept Jesus Christ as their king, coming in to save them from the power of Rome. Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day on the most humble picture available to that culture. The God of all creation deserved honor. And instead he chose gentleness. As that same crowd who would crucify him in less than a week later cried out showing him honor, Jesus offered them gentleness. They oh, we accept you. Save us from Rome. And Jesus didn't come to save them from Rome. He came to save them from their sins. And he came, he should have rode in on a noble steed. He deserved that at the very least. He deserved that. And he told the disciples, I want you to go get the picture of servanthood because that's what I'm riding in on. That's what happened on Palm Sunday. That's this day that we celebrate. It was a picture of gentleness. Extreme gentleness. He knew that less than a week later their hearts would be calloused enough to kill the very Son of God. And yet he rode into Jerusalem and humbled himself to the death of the cross. His nature of gentleness was seeking their redemption. What an incredible fruit. And he wants to produce that same mindset in you and me. He wants to see that fruit grow out of our lives. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He wants us to have that same mindset. 
who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Remember, gentleness is not looking to be right. It's not show its own strength. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Jesus Christ rode in with gentleness that day. Servanthood. And what is gentleness trying to do? It's seeking your redemption. It seeks the redemption. Gentleness is strength under control. It's the power that is restrained for the purpose of the master. A lot of times we get in the way of this characteristic. We don't allow this characteristic to be produced out of our lives because when somebody does us wrong, what do we do? We strike back. And God looks at our strike as we strike back and like, why did you strike with so much weakness? <laughs> when I had my power in gentleness, you could have hit him with that and it could have redeemed the relationship. Why do we always revert back to our own power when we have a relationship with the God of the universe? Why do we lean on our own understanding when God says, trust in me? Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge me. I'll direct your path. Why do we always revert back to our strength and our solutions when we have the God of all the universe who is able to produce gentleness in your spirit and mind? Gentleness is seeking redemption. Now we have one more fruit to talk about, and that is self-control. Now I ask you to exhibit self-control because we're going to wait two weeks to do that because Easter is next Sunday. We have one more fruit of the Spirit to talk about. And I want to put together a picture of how it is one fruit. Just one. There's so much power to this, these just two verses, just two verses. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. There's no law out there that says you can't do that. Every, every culture on the planet says we're okay with these things. Every culture. Show me goodness. I'll take it. Show me kindness. Everybody's okay with this. We have one more to talk about. And then let's put it all together. But I think it's amazing that it lined up that we get to take a minute and look at the most awesome gift that was ever given to mankind, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection next Sunday. And every piece of the fruit of the Spirit was shown in that action. Next Sunday, invite people. Let's bring them in. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. We're not the answer, but we know a guy. He is the answer to every problem out there. And when we counteract people, opposition, why don't you hit them with the most strength known in the universe? Gentleness. It's a strength that surpasses any physical strength we have. Let's pray for that fruit of the Spirit. Because as Christians, we need God's fruit showing out of our life. Because there's a lost and dying world out there that needs to meet him. Let him show the evidence of who he is through your life and mine. Stand with me this morning.